Welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be filming episode two of the Neuro Marvels. I'm Dr. Gwen Palafox, and I'm a neurotypical psychologist who really just does her best every day. Dana? I'm Dr. Dana <laughs> Waters. I'm a uh, neurodivergent psychologist, and you do a great job trying to, try to align and understand. Yeah. Thanks, Dana. Um, so we are on episode two, and... You know, Dana and I are just having too much fun, so we're yep. just going to keep this train a rolling. Yep. Um, so today, Dana and I really wanted to bring up the topic of um, sensory processing and sensory profiles. This is mm -hmm. something that we run into quite a bit, actually. So, Dana, why don't you get us started on sure. um, just sensory processing in general, maybe as a general idea or um, what it is. Yeah. So yeah, I teach about this as well, where I teach. And uh, it, most people are familiar with the five senses that, that we talk about that people are, uh, you know, let me back up. So when you people say I have a sixth sense, it's outside of, you know, it's meant to be like ESP. It's outside of the ones that we know and talk about every day, which are vision, hearing, taste, uh, and I have slash texture because texture goes along with that, becomes really important in autistic folks. Uh, smell and touch. So those are like the big five that we talk about mostly. Um, and then there's other ones though. We'll talk a little bit today about proprioception and something called interoception. And those can be six and seven, and you can sort of keep going in terms of mm -hmm. splitting hairs and some of those. So we think about... Um, sensory things have two components to them. So the first thing is the sense organ. So like our eyes are our sense organ for vision and smell our nose and some of our mouth is our sense organ for smelling and tasting, that kind of thing, or touch our skin. There's some little funny little uh, uh, receptors in our skin. One of my favorite words of all time is pancinian corpuscles uh, that feel pressure and things like that. Uh, and then, so we've got all these things that take in information from our environment. And those are, are like our sense organs. That travels to our brain. And then we make sense of that input. And that is uh, what we would talk about as perception. So we've got two pieces that we've got the sen sensation pieces and then we've got perception. We know in autistics that it's a combination of both of those things that can contribute to sensory overload um, or some folks have senses that they're not that cued into. Proprioception being one example, and I'll get into, and interoception, we can talk about that more when we get to that. Um, but everybody has those, has all those basic uh, seven or eight uh, senses, and then our brain processes it, right? So, and I can't see on its own. Um, it's really how our brain makes sense of it. And so those of our viewers that have, and you have had a child, have very little babies. Right when they're born, they're kind of looking around and not looking at much. Um, as we develop, all those senses get tuned in through experience and our genetics and some other kinds of things as, as we go along. Um, and are sort of are continually changing. What's really interesting about senses in autistic folks is uh, we have evidence now neurologically that autistic folks are born with more neural connections than neurotypical babies are. And there's this thing that happens in the third trimester, maybe about three weeks before a baby's born. There's all, we, have, we have brain cells that are called neurons and then we have connections between them. And we know in neurotypical uh, babies, those neural connections start to prune back or um, get cut off about three weeks before birth. Uh, with autistic babies, though that process doesn't happen. So in a way, autistic babies are born, born into the world like feeling more in terms of these senses, right? So you think about typical Western births, they're in a hospital, it's cold, it's uh, noisy, it's really bright lights, those kinds of things. So autistic babies come into the world sort of hyper-wired, if you will, in terms of senses. Um, and then as we develop, uh, that does change a bit, but the, the, some of the theory is because we come in out of the chute, if you will, somewhat hyper-wired, um, it's sort of a setup a little bit for that overwhelm. And if you think about that coupled with uh, being a baby, you can't talk yet, 
even being a little kid, you can't necessarily put words to things. It, it sort of explains a little bit why uh, very young children and children have a harder time um, with sensory kinds of things than adults do who have figured out some coping mechanisms by then. And maybe their brain has actually figured out a way to wire and move them through the world that's a little easier to navigate, right? And then these senses, the, these perceptions vary wildly from person to person, neurotypical or not, right? Um, and those can have fluctuations. Uh, women will report when they're pregnant, all this, a lot of this kind of stuff changes. My mom would talk about even the smell of bacon would make her totally sick when she was pregnant and she normally loved bacon. So there's all kinds of things that can contribute to the stress and hormones and different times of the month for women and, and uh, seasonal sort of variations for men. There's all kinds of things that can affect this. And I always tell folks that they're asking about sensory issues um, in the, in the uh, neurodiverse paradigm, the sort of umbrella over ADD, ADHD, um, autism, and some other things, uh, sensory issues are always there in autism. So that, that's one of the things that sort of is a, is a cornerstone of that. Not everybody that has sensory issues is autistic, but every autistic person has some sort of sensory issues even if they sort of come and go. So that's sort of the, the, the main load down of those things. Vision, people are, are familiar with hearing, taste. Texture may be one that people, uh, autistic folks will certainly understand. And we see this a lot in, in little kids who have um, food aversions, right? Yeah. It's almost always texture. Um, sometimes it can be temperature of the food. Um, or if it's spicy or things like that, but it's almost always texture and it's some aversion is like a, a negative reaction to something. Um, and so the little kids will only eat certain foods. And my mom swears that all I ate for one solid year was like hot dogs. And now I don't even want, I don't like hot dogs, but you know, very limited sort of diet. Um, and that texture is something I see with food that really does tend to pervade with adults as well. Some people yeah. are really, I can't eat that. It's too creepy. Yep. Um, Smell is, is one that I have. We, we went to a baseball game the other day and in this particular stadium, they have these things called garlic fries and it makes the air have this really sort of weird, slightly putrid smell. And the whole time we were at the game, when I would get a waft of it, I, I would get this feeling of like, ah, you know, kind of nause nauseated. Yeah. Um, even though I knew what it was and try to talk myself out of it, so those kinds of things. And then touch, a lot of people are really aware of. Um, a lot of autistics don't like to be touched by other people um, or certain touch things will bother them. The, the classic tags in the shirts, right, for autistic kids. Um, I cut every tag out of every shirt I have just because it rubs on there, um, kind of bothers me. The debate about fabric, right? Some people really like wool and that's the only thing they'll wear. And other people are like, oh, I can't wear wool. I only want to wear cotton. And, it's so idiopathic from person to person. The ones that people aren't as familiar with is this one called proprioception and this one called interoception. Proprioception is sort of like, where am I in space? Where is my body in relation to various things, right? And autistics typically uh, are a little bit impoverished in this. Like I, I lost count. Of, if I had a dollar for every time I ran into a door jam when I'm walking through the door, uh, kind of not aware of where I am in space, and then interoception really is like um, our internal awareness like that. Like, um, is my stomach full? Am I hungry? Mm -hmm. uh, are my eyes dry? Am I, should I be thirsty? Uh, to really sort of freaky things. Like I, I have redundant nerves in all of my uh, facial nerves and my teeth. So it's really hard for like dentists to numb me. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's part of autism, who knows? But I can feel, things, I can like feel my intestines moving when they're moving and that kind of thing. And then other people, so that's sort of hyper aware. Other autistics can have hypo O awareness. So they'll work all day and forget to eat, for example, because they, they're not tuned into uh, cues of hunger. Little kids won't get woken up in the middle of the night to use the restroom, let's say. And so bedwetting can be really common and younger. I, I think I, I bet on and off, not as frequently, but until I was 12. Uh, and now I know that's pretty normal for an autistic kid. Um, so all these sorts of things can be um, hypo, like low, or hyper, 
And some people have like lifelong pervasive things. Like I've known people that um, bright lights always bother them. Doesn't matter their stress level or not. And then folks maybe that bright lights would bother them if they were already high on some of these other input variables, if you will. Um, and so it, it, it's so situational, but all of us have some sort of um, sensory sensitivity is the word you hear, right? Yeah. And it's probably because those neural pathways have more connections than neurotypical folks do. And there, there has been some palliative evidence for that. Uh, and or the perception part of our brain hooks into these things uh, more and, and uh, more areas of our brain light up, especially if something started irritating to us. So maybe we do learn over time to try to shut those out as a way to cope with that. So you'll see teenagers, young adults will say, you know, I'm not aware of those feeling things. And then when you start to get them in touch with them and paying attention to it, you can go through a period of like hyper awareness where it's really annoying because being numb is easier. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. And then I work a lot with autistic clients to deal with these and how can you manage them in your environment and so on. Yeah. yeah and Dana, you know, there's, there's one other sense that uh, that runs um, that I bump into a lot is vest the vestibular. Yeah, um, I had that. I had that with hearing, but yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Uh, but that it. idea of like, well, we can expand vestibular, we can expand hearing, then, which is just that idea of um, the perception of spinning, mm -hmm. or um, height, or like how high you are off of something. Yeah. Um, and I know that's like a, a visual like, thing, like you're tilting, but, sort but, yeah, of, or yeah. that you're like kind of vertigo, like kind yeah. of ideas, you know. Um, yes, yes. And that, and that's something too, because like. There are a lot of clients that I've supported that like to spin because they're hypo-regulated. They're under-regulated oh, there. And so okay. they like to have those sensations or they don't get affected on roller coasters or things like that gotcha. as much. Like they yeah. kind of seek those types of things. You know, I think it's so important that we're talking about the the senses, um, mm -hmm. sensations, registration, perception, because I feel like it's the first way in which a person encodes the environment that they're in. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. which inevitably impacts the way that they look uh, behaviorally, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and yeah. So, yeah. As a neurotypical person, um, if I didn't have the understanding of sensations, um, sensitivities, mm -hmm. I might misperceive someone's behavior as being non-compliant, mm -hmm. um, uh, weird, odd, mm -hmm. um, just, um, a bad parenting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, cause you think <laughs> Always about blame food, the parents. Yeah. right? Right. But you, you know, you think yeah. about like food, right? Yeah. And you were talking oh, yeah. about texture. I have another one that I have a client that I support who it's not only texture, but it's the visual, the look of it. So oh, sure. if it looks a certain way, yeah, they won't yeah. even get near it. If it's a yeah. certain color, Mm -hmm. they won't get near it. Um, yeah. I have a client who lacy curtains and eyeballs, like eyeballs oh. on anything, eyeballs on like uh, stuffed animals, uh, googly eyeballs. I mean, oh, they freak her yeah. out, like, yeah. you know, and then yeah. curtains, um, she says her skin gets. Lacy curtains, you say. Lacy, like oh. those lacy um, uh, curtains that old, old style. This is great. You said, you, you said, you were going to say it kind of makes her skin crawl. It makes her skin. Mm -hmm. She, she has a, 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 a tactile reaction on her skin. So when we, she sees that. Yeah. So one thing I didn't mention is something called synesthesia, which is the crossing over of two senses, whether or not that's your, what you're describing there. But sort of classically, this would be like someone who can taste colors yeah. or see sound, you know, sounds, it sounds yeah. really weird. I, um, I can have, I have this in terms of um, when I'm listening to music and if I key into it, I can sort of see these, this movement stuff, which is kind of cool. Um, but people can actually have it be really, really strong uh, reaction like this reaction to these lacy curtains. We also know that synesthesia is a pretty rare thing but it occurs about 50% more, excuse me, in, neuro, in the neurodiverse population than it does in the neurotypical population. And again, sort of has to do with this overwiring, mm -hmm. right? So senses that aren't supposed to be yoked to each other end up being yoked to each other and they're connected in some way, right? Yeah. There's a, there's a wonderful book called the, um, 
the particular sadness of lemon cake. And I can't remember the author's name. And before I knew I was autistic, I was so enthralled with this book because it's all these creative descriptions of synesthesia, which is, you know, representational. Um, but yeah, that's a great example of that sort of aversion where she can look at a particular thing like these old curtains. What's interesting too is like, Therapists that aren't aware of these connections and autism might say, well, there must be trauma. There must be something about those drapes or the, yes. and there may be, but it could also just be, that's what I meant by that idiopathic, like specific person thing, like the googly eyes or that lace curtain thing. Um, it just, it sort of zip wires into the brain and kind of blows it up so that you can't pay attention to anything else when that's happening. Right. That's another piece because – so let's talk about that, Dana, because if you're flooded mm -hmm. and overwhelmed mm -hmm. by your senses, mm -hmm. right, and they're ca it's causing distress, yeah, right, we know theoretically that that would impact attention, oh, my yeah. ability to attend to the environment. So mm -hmm. let's say this is happening in a classroom setting, for example. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And a teacher's, you know, uh, maybe maybe I'll date us here, um, Dana, but yeah. <laughs> teacher's writing on a chalkboard with chalk. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. That sound. Yeah. That, ugh, like, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I think about that. I can't even imagine. But it's one of my favorite sounds. It's so funny. But yeah. Really? <laughs> um, but, you know, but maybe that's overwhelming. And now yeah. we've got someone who's in distress. Would we say, look, they're they um, they're not a good student. Yeah, yeah. They they won't pay attention. They're not motivated yeah. to learn. Yeah, right. And if it's a really young child, they might not even know that that's what's making their attention get hijacked. They may not even be able to say, "Oh yeah, writing on chalkboard is a trigger for me." So then yeah. you get, like you said, that people looking from the outside and like, oh, that kid doesn't pay attention or what are the parents doing or whatever it is. Yeah. Right? The classroom yeah. management's poor. The teacher can't teach. I mean, like right. there's yeah. all these pieces. And I and I feel like the sensory systems, the sensitivities is actually something that is rarely thought yeah. about or discussed. Um, really? Wow. Where I see that a lot in classrooms. Um I see that a lot, even in the work that our colleagues do. Wow. You know, when we when we think about supporting um, individuals that have sensory sensitivities, and I mm -hmm. will say it is I, it, just clinically, I I'm in agreement that all of my clients who are neurodivergent, or all my clients who are who who have a who have an autistic diagno uh, mm -hmm. an autism diagnosis, um, they all have sensory sensitivities. Yeah, yeah. there's some there's something there, and yeah that oftentimes leads to just like their endurance for being out in the world, their mm -hmm. endurance for social interactions, their endurance for um, learning new things, or maybe like um, right now I'm seeing this because it's it's getting hotter, but heat sensitivities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Temperature sensitivities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Dana, as someone's listening to this, like our audience is listening to this and you know, our I think our goal of this podcast mm -hmm. is really to create this space to learn, to be curious, yeah. um, and have it impact the way in which we might not only think about ourselves, but we might think about others. Yeah. I mean, there's so much societal pressure, right? Uh, uh, for those uh, seeing this video, and I'll describe this for our podcast uh, listeners, um, I have a lot of clothing aversions. So even how something will sit on my body, like if it, if it feels uneven or there's like a sleeve that pulls funny or um, the fabric itself is annoying, uh, that will just, that'd be all I think about, right? And so as a, as a younger person, there's a lot of peer pressure to be a certain way, wear certain things. Mm -hmm. So I can remember sort of suffering through uh, wearing a lot of those kinds of things, whereas today, you know, I would never, I would never do that to myself. But uh, I'll, I'll even share this with my students. I have, I have, I think I counted them the other day. I have 21 of these uh, iron-free cotton uh, blend uh, uh, button-up collar shirts from LL Bean. Not, I'm not trying to put an ad in here. Uh, and LL but Bean. But if you're listening, yeah. send Dana some free shirts. <laughs> And LL Bean uh, cardigans and sweaters, right? Yeah. In a bunch of different colors. And I'll tell my students this. I'll be like, you know, actually, 
you think I'm wearing the same outfit every day. And I actually have eight of the white ones and three of the blue ones. And, and so I'm actually swapping it out, but I actually like to um, share that with folks because there would be a time in my life where the, the, the peer pressure or the worry about what other people would think would be so strong that I wouldn't do that, right? Be like, oh my God, people are gonna think I'm a slob and I wear the same thing all the time. And really what it is, is to have a, an outfit that feels predictable and I don't have to worry about how it's gonna feel on my body. And there'll even be some days like if I have something new, like this morning when I was picking up my outfit, I'm like, oh, I have that new sweater I haven't worn yet. Maybe I should do that. I'm like, well, today needing attention, probably not the day to do that, right? Yep. So parlay that into like a child who doesn't even know what those sensitivities are yet. Uh, that we're forming basic relationships and what people are thinking. And then people that don't understand are going to make those snap judgments, right? Oh, what's wrong with that person or what's that person doing? Or that kid isn't sitting still in their chair or not paying attention or they're sitting, they have to tap their, uh, their pencil a bunch and it's driving everybody else crazy or whatever else it is versus that checking in and saying, you know, what's going on with you and what do you need? you work a lot with younger folks. And I met, I think the, the uh, barrier to figuring that out is harder because they're not necessarily aware of everything that triggers them. They don't have the language for it. And then to do it even in real time, when you're stressed out and overwhelmed, your, our language capacity just takes a dive. And so actually to put things in words and explain it to the other person um, doesn't go well. Yeah. You know, it's hard enough for adults and even sort of figured out some coping strategies for that. But yeah, living in that environment, that neurotypical environment that doesn't pay attention to those things at all um, is it, it, it's this huge stress, especially on kids um, who have to be in environments. I and mean, you mentioned something about endurance. I love that word, there's a uh, scientific phrase for it called allostatic load, which is sort of like, how much are you carrying? How much have you already been exposed to in any given day? And I'll use the bucket analogy. So yep. we all have like these five gallon Home Depot buckets. And um, if you haven't slept well, now there's some water in your bucket. And if you forgot to have breakfast, now there's water in your bucket. And so every, the pandemic, it's taken up a ton of room in everybody's bucket, neurotypical or not, right? Yep. And so how full is your bucket on any given day? And then does it take that, just that one more thing to have it splash all over? And that is that kid sitting in the classroom who can't sit still because all they're thinking about is, you know, uh, how their shoes feel. Or yeah. Someone forced them to wear socks and they can't stand the feeling of socks. Yeah, yeah. Or heaven forbid there's a... Um there's a assembly that day or an earthquake drill uh, yeah. for those of us living in California, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, or lockdown drills Ooh, now today. Oh these are, these are kind of new stressors, yeah. you know, going back to that bucket, that idea of like, you know, we have a limited amount of resources. Yeah. Um, all of us do. And yeah. you know, what you have in the bank, what you have in that bucket, what the spend is, right? Mm -hmm. That I think the other piece that I really needed to wrap my head around as a neurotypical person was that some of the things that I take for granted, mm -hmm. um, my clients spend a lot of energy on. Yeah. So for example, like, um, I know I need to brush my teeth. I really, really dislike the way that feels in my mm -hmm. mouth, but I know mm -hmm. I have to do it. Yeah. Like that might, you know, that might only cost me, you know, um, you know, a couple drops of water or nothing at all. Cause it's like, I don't mm -hmm. register it, mm -hmm. but that might cost, you know, a few cups of water for, for yeah. a client in that bucket. Absolutely. Um, so there's that piece too. And really trying to understand what is the spend? Like, what is the cost yeah. of yeah. all these things that, you know, add up you know, it, if it's only one drop that leads to the splash, right? Yeah, I think yeah. this is the other thing that that when I hear it as when I'm supporting, you know, a parent or a system, yeah. they'll say to me, you know, Gwen, it's like um, th the reaction so disproportionate from right, the, right. the event. And it's like, yeah, yeah. all we did yeah. is offered them, a, you know, a blue pencil over red and then yeah. they exploded. And I'm like, that's it's because that there's a last thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's cumulative. There, there was a cumulative yeah. buildup. That just happened to be the last drop. 
Exactly. Yeah. And I, I, I think that you do see that kind of meltdown phase more in kids because they don't know their patterns as well. And again, they don't know yeah. how to voice it. They're still figuring it out. Not that this doesn't happen in adults because it certainly does. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, absolutely. And to, I like to use the bucket analogy because we can talk about things being added and stress being added, but we can also borrow from the chronic pain uh, world about people are hear this a lot now about how many spoons do you have, right? Yeah. And so that is that I start the day with five spoons. And if I give them away for things like that, now I'm at the end of the day, I have no spoons or I've gone into the negative spoonage, <laughs> right? And then I'm going to have to, I, I'll do this socially. I'll, if I'm going to have something that is out in the world a lot, I plan days after that for decompression time. Uh, or I'll space those things out. Like I know if I have to do something um, big social connections or something that's going to be triggers, like the pride parade, I love going, but oh my God, uh, then I may not, you know, someone says, oh, you want to go see this new movie with me? You like the day after I'd say, well, actually, can we push it to the following week? So that idea of keeping that bucket manageable or not giving away all your spoons, but absolutely it's cumulative. And that's when it, it doesn't seem to make sense you can have a kid who um, touches something that isn't one of their uh, sensory sensitivities, but they've had all these other ones pile on and all of a sudden someone touches them on the shoulder and they, they just blow up, right? Because yeah. it is, it's just, it, it reminds me of, for those Monty Python uh, watchers out there, there's, there's one where the guy's eating a ton and he says, have one wafer thin mint. It's that last <laughs> little thing and then the guy's body just explodes. Yeah. It's such a good example of, of that. And I think that I haven't watched it yet, but the new Disney movie, uh, Turning Red, I think a lot of people in the autism community are saying that's a good example of like, oh, I can't handle all this. And I just sort of turn into this other thing. Yeah. 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 You know, Dina, as we're talking about there's kind of like this internal external thing that that where my mind goes, mm. which is we understand how someone is internally, privately, if you will, in many yeah. ways um, in the world. Yeah. How what what is the comfort? You know, what are the edges of comfort? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what does stress look like um, on this system? Right. The other, I think, externally um because of course they everyone lives in a context everyone lives in an environment in a context right. so you know how do we also it's like we need to empower the the person themselves um as they get um more knowledge of themselves to mm -hmm. do what you're doing right to be yeah. like wow you know i know this is going to be really taxing on me i really want to show up to this thing yeah. in the best way possible so can we delay that by a week right yeah, i yeah. know my neurological reset time is going to be two days on that or what, yeah yeah whatever yeah. that is a while to learn those things. right yeah absolutely yep so there's that piece mm -hmm. um that is so important and that brings me to this um feeling or the that one of the senses you were talking about which is interoception mm -hmm. and i feel like interoception um having a sense of the state of your body it, yeah if we want yeah. to say it in that way, is highly and heavily connected to self-awareness. Yeah. And if we don't help people develop their own self-knowledge, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. adding symbols to that, maybe words, pictures, yeah. how then can we help them manage themselves exactly right. like you are, right? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. a good example of that, Dana, is, you know, Dana and I were going to tape on July the 5th yeah. and you oh, know, God. so beautifully you're like, oh my gosh, I live in this place where people really love July 4th and mm -hmm. there's gonna be fireworks going off all night. I'm not gonna get great sleep and yeah. I'm just not gonna show up to tape an episode in a way that I'm gonna feel good about. Exactly, right? great example. Say, yeah. Right, or like, you're yeah. like, I don't wanna wear a new cardigan today. I wanna be yeah. sharp. Um, That's gonna yeah. take too much, uh, that might add water in my bucket that I don't actually want. Right. Right. And that, you know, you bring up an important point too. So when you learn these things too, I mean, a lot of those kinds of things I can be in the groove and I don't have to spend a lot of energy even thinking about. Yeah. But for younger folks or folks that haven't gotten in that groove, or if it's something that you don't have a groove for, um, then yeah, it, it sort of builds up and heightens and you can't attend to other things. And that, I would say that's the majority of the work that I do uh, with adult uh, autistics in my practice is learning those things about yourself mm -hmm. and managing them, right? I had a guy I saw for years, a uh, uh, really early appointment. We met at like 6.30 in the morning. Um, and not surprisingly, he would not eat before he came, he'd forget. 
And uh, he was also a, a Diet Coke lover. And so the first thing I do when he came and I have my office in my house, first thing I do when he come in my house is I hand him a Diet Coke and a protein bar and we, we'd have breakfast together, right? Um, and we talked a lot about that. Um, he's like, I've never had any therapists do this with me before, but we talked about it in the context of paying attention to cues and those kinds of things. Cause he, he had a tendency to work all day and forget to eat or use the bathroom or anything along those lines. Um, so really it, it is about teaching self-awareness. Um, and last episode, and I think you and I practice similarly is to not have judgment about it, right? It just is. These are these things that are unique to you. I'm so blessed to have a partner that can normalize that and just say, Hey, whatever works for you. That's great. Right. Who cares what other people think? Um, have, you know, six blue cardigans. Who cares? Right. Does it work? Why are you worried about it? Easy for me to say as a fully formed autonomous uh, 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 adult, but for kids, there's so much judgment, right? Kids judge each other. They snicker behind each other. There's bullying that takes place. Um, and then there's this paradigm idea of the dominant culture and then the uh, minority culture. Um, th this series that was on um, about an autistic kid uh, called Atypical, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about that show, but there was one, uh, I think it was the second or third season where the main character's girlfriend um, wants to have the school dance in a way that her autistic boyfriend can attend. And, you know, the loud music and uh, was the main trigger for him. So she really presses the teachers and parents to have it be where everybody else wears headphones to listen to music. And the character gets to come in and have the place not loud. Now, even you know, as, as a member of the sort of the dominant, we have all grown up in that dominant culture, that ableistic culture. I was like, well, that's sort of silly because you're gonna make all these other people do it and he could just wear the noise canceling headphones. But the, the scene was so beautiful and I sort of get choked up because you go in there and all the other kids are like, that's cool, I'll wear my headphones. And to just see that zeitgeist shift from the majority just saying, I'm not gonna pay attention to that to almost like that upside down world from Stranger Things, right? Where it's the kid who's autistic, it's quiet. Why not? Why, why don't everybody wear headphones and not have the loudness everywhere? Yeah, and it's those kinds of perspective changes that are so important. I think uh, for to teach how to six themselves, so they feel like they can take up space in the world. Parents, teachers, uh, folks like that. That it, those are those aha moments that I get so psyched about as a psychologist because it's like, ooh, that little flip, and now I can see something I didn't see before. Right. Yeah, it's really powerful because it, yeah. it has this kind of ripple effect, I think, mm -hmm. in the way that we think about things, you know, yeah. even like, um, I love this idea even of um, taking it one step further um, of sensory simulations. And I don't yeah. know if you've ever done these types of things. I've done this with, um, Say more. Um, you know, uh, neurotypical uh, teachers, um, employers mm. where it's like, all right, let's just add a level of pressure uh, to reading something that Ooh. you can you can barely decode. Nice. Right. Nice. It's yeah. just yeah. adding those levels. There's some really nice like YouTube videos on sensory simulations about the way someone might experience. It's not it's, you know, all sounds at the same yeah. you know volume yeah. at once, yeah. you know, these yeah. types of things. It just gives another I think, you know, the heart of our intention for yeah. this podcast was really to drive curiosity and empathy yeah. um, for all, for, for like, for a neurotypical perspective, but a and a neurodivergent perspective, but yeah. you know, for both, because right. we are, these, these are the dominant culture, the neuro majority um, kind of go on and, and, and we live life in a, in this very, um, I think, sometimes easy way in regards mm. to like, oh, I get what's normal. It's not mm -hmm. hard for me. I don't have to spend extra energy there. Right. Um, we just kind of lose sight of, I think that there are different ways to be yeah. in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We just have to pay attention. I think that's another piece for us. It, you know, uh, you know, Dana, you and I were like, how do we drive attention? Even if it's for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, yeah. whatever that is. Yeah. How do we empower people with, with information to maybe change a mindset, to, to shift it, to make a pivot? 
Yeah, and that that empathy piece is so important because I, as you were talking, I was envisioning like uh, uh, I live in Seattle, and so going down to Pike Place Market's fun once in a while. Unless it, it, we'll think about doing it, we're like, well, there'll be a ton of people there, <laughs> you know. And if it's going to be a day where it's going to be packed, yeah, maybe not. The, but I was thinking of like a little kid going into that scenario. Um, there's you can handle more when you have the people you're with. Uh, are taking an empathetic stance, right? Yeah. Being seen. So if, if a parent's like, I know this is going to be overloading for you, do you want to go? Then now you're not alone in it. And it actually gives some resilience and gives some tempering to be able to handle that, right? Yeah. And we were at that ball game and I, I mentioned the, the smell stuff to my, uh, to my wife and she even said, um, are you going to be okay? Do you need to leave? And I said, no, just telling you was enough so that you know that's sort of going on. And yeah. that, it really illustrates the power of being seen and getting that validation. And I think that that's why that scene and Atypical hit me the way it did, because it's a whole group of uh, even students and peers saying, yeah, let's, let's flip this and try it the other way, right? Yeah. I can remember in junior high, uh, they blindfolded us one day and we walked all around uh, the place to, to see what it was like to be blind. And at the time I thought, oh yeah, per I can do that. But I have sight privilege because I didn't grow up blind and I don't have to live that way every day. But the whole idea is get a glimpse into it so you can have a sense of what that might be like, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And, yeah, and then so you can be someone, I've, I've been out and about before where I can clearly see it's somebody who's probably on the spectrum having some issues and even just be sort of moving over them and saying, um, you know, do you need anything? Is, is there anything I can help? And that alone, even from a stranger, I think can go a long way for folks. Having those allies, having people that just sort of get it and can, um, you can see them seeing you. And that's just the basic human need, right? For everybody. I was just gonna say that, like that that's something that everyone, that humans respond to right? Yeah, to be yeah. seen, understood at this very, um, I think, core, vulnerable yeah. kind of place. And yeah. that, you know, we, you and I haven't necessarily spoken about this, but you know, a lot of times when we speak about sensory sensitivities, mm -hmm. and we're supporting our clients, um, co-regulation tends to be a, a, a term or a phrase that comes up, meaning, yeah. Yeah. you know, if someone's having a difficult time regulating their senses mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. in a moment can another person help to co-regulate them yeah right yeah, yeah. um and i think this is the power of relationship you oh, know absolutely. relationships yeah. are uh powerful when you are seen in the context of that yeah. relationship and someone meets you where you are yeah, you know, I think that's um, why, you know, uh, uh, especially women and girls uh, gravitate towards animals to such a great degree, mm. because that there is that sense of, you know, uh, it can actually be sort of irritating at times when your dog's just staring at you constantly, but um, you're right, no, oh, I want something. Uh, but there also is this kind of uh, unconditional um, co-regulator and, you know, service animals that we train, especially to work with autistic kids can do, you know, deep pressure um, can stop a kid from doing a harmful stim, you know, those kinds of things or redirect it. Uh, and for people in the environment to know that if someone is totally to overload or meltdown and they're doing something like uh, hitting themselves or uh, a, a visible stim that makes someone else comfortable, instead of saying, oh my God, what's wrong with you? Uh, say, oh, what do you need? We need to get you out of here right now. And now is not the time to be you know, um, having a conversation about, <laughs> uh, you should be okay. What are you doing? Stop doing that. It's like, yeah, no, you need an exit strategy right now. And that's, you know, that's one of my passions. And the reason I started the awake project was to not just to get information out there for autistics, but for people that are in their lives or just people that want to know more about it. So there is that with understanding comes empathy, right? Yeah. When we talk about any kind of in and out group, uh, political affiliations and, and all those kinds of things. It, it really is about, it's an us and them because there's a fear about an unknown, right? Or there's yep. an assumption about an unknown. And as soon as you shed light on that and you say, oh, oh, that's what's going on. Okay, now I get it. Right? Yeah. Or I'm, I'm starting to understand that. Now you've got a connection there, like you said, that relationship and uh, 
people, you, you automatically feel held more, even if people aren't actually saying that. Yeah. And, and to create spaces where you can have differing opinions yeah. about something without, um, and, 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 and still feeling heard and seen, yeah. you know, that, yeah. that being heard and seen doesn't mean that someone needs to be in agreement. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I think we get, that gets lost. Um, especially yeah, you, you can have both, both at the same time. I can yeah. be frustrated with you and also still love you. Yeah. And yeah, it's so easy to, to lose sight of that for sure. And then just get anxious about it and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Dana, when you were talking about the meltdown, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe what's also helpful for, I find, is the difference between a meltdown and a tantrum. Oh, God. Yeah. The, <laughs> the, the big T tantrum the big, word. The big, the big T. Um, and that oftentimes meltdowns are misperceived as tantrums. Yeah. Um, and that we see tantrums usually as something that's more volitional or something that's more yeah. in someone's control versus a meltdown is a, is is an overloaded system, like a danger, mm -hmm. Will Robinson danger kind of situation yeah. where yeah. that person is not in control right. of their of their system, their body. And so the way that we might address or support yeah. would be different for a meltdown than it would yeah. be in a tantrum. But yeah. that doesn't always happen, I think. I think those two things don't necessarily, those tantrums and meltdowns don't typically get uh, delineated. Um, yeah, because I could, I, like, let's just go with a, a, a real tantrum for what that means, right? I, I was trained as an Adlerian psychologist, so we would even look at, okay, if a kid's having a tantrum, what what are they trying to convey? What is the purpose of their behavior? Yeah. And whether it's, I want attention or I want to be left alone or I'm not getting my way and it's a control thing, you know, I'm trying to buy for control and all of other things. We still want to be aware of, well, why is that kid having a tantrum if we, if it's like the good old fashioned tantrum, yeah. if it's a meltdown, um, that's that sensory overload. And there's a sense of, I, I have no other way to deal with this than to you know, fall down or start hitting things or start biting, you know, or screaming or whatever it is, that sense of uh, what my wife and I will refer to as, I feel like I want to tear my face off, right? Mm. Or my skin off. And it, for an adult, I can say, oh my God, I have this feeling like I just want to, don't look at me, I'm hideous, or I want to tear my face off. For a little kid, they can feel that building and they don't know to circumvent it. You have to learn to do that. But yeah, to have a have parents, caregivers, teachers um, understand why is this kid doing this, right? Um, and if it's an autistic kid, it, it's almost always going to be sensory overwhelm, uh, and then you're going to treat those differently, right? Yeah. So a, a good old fashioned tantrum, um, depending on the situation, it might be indicated to like ignore the child, give them space. With meltdown, it might mean they really need your help getting out of whatever is triggering them. So if they're down at Pike Place Market, we need to leave or yeah. something along those lines. And they, so the response is really different. Yeah. A, par a partner for adults where they say, I'm, I'm starting to panic. Okay, we need to get out of here right now, right? It isn't about, oh, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Look around, You're, you know, that sort of patronizing yeah. way of trying to get someone or my personal favorite, oh, just calm down. That's, that's like the... <laughs> It's, it's, not it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal, deal, Dana. Yeah, it's not a big deal for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you can, you know, also talk about sensory issues that can actually take you beyond uh, a meltdown to shut down yep. where you actually, everything sort of blanks out and you're in this weird fugue place. Um, to me, think about what's going on neurologically, right? Your, your brain is just saying, I can't do it. I'm shutting down. It, it's adaptive, right? Yeah. So I've heard family members say things like, well, we had planned to do this this day and you're being rigid and stubborn and you don't wanna do this. Um, and actually in that state, you really do need to just give them space and, uh, or provide nurturing or just ask them what they need or you know, shut all the blinds in the house or whatever to bring all the, as much water out of that bucket again as you can. Yeah, and they need help because in those moments, the brain, the higher parts of the brain, the brain that can problem, the parts of the brain that, you know, like problem solve, yeah. analyze, use language, those yeah. are not accessible at that That's time. Right. 
Those right. are completely, you know, they're they're shut off. Yeah. Um, one of my clients has called it um, a whiteout. Yeah, it's a good way. Where to they it. just yeah. see static. Yeah. It's just snow. Yeah. And they know. Um, and I think you know sometimes our colleagues, Dana, will call that dissociative. Yeah, and there's a difference because you know I can talk about that for, as a professional and as someone who has experienced both. Yeah. Right. Dissociation yeah. is more of like a, I'm not here. It's like an, it's like a, I'm out of my body. Um, the, the numb feeling is similar between both, but when you're in shutdown, it's this weird sort of feeling. It's like, you're, you're not numb. Uh, you're aware of what's going on in your surroundings, but everything sort of feels like you're under jello. Like everything's just a little slower. I always tell folks, mm -hmm. I have this weird feeling like my lips are swollen, but they're not. It's a sort of weird feeling in your face like the world you just feel like there's a buffer between you and the physical world but yeah. you're aware of it being there in dissociation yeah. you're not yeah i mean the 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 what the brain's doing might be similar in terms of i need to protect you from this thing but the experience of them are very different right? yeah and you people can have both yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this could be another episode, but I mean, even just talking about, you know, uh, the differences with like schizophrenia, psychosis, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, and, and that's something that I'm seeing more and more as I support adults who mm. um, are autistic and have mental health yeah. concerns. Yeah. Um, how do you start to parse those apart? And and mm -hmm. how do we support someone in this very nuanced kind of way? I mean, mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. what we're really what we're really highlighting is nuance. And, yeah. you know, in our first episode about labelism, because we made a, <laughs> now, now we're just going to call it word. labelism, Dana. <laughs> um, you know, we're talking about the nuances of labels and how mm -hmm. important it is to use labels, um, yeah. be mindful of the way that labels are used. I mean, that sometimes they're not necessary and sometimes they block mm -hmm. and sometimes they facilitate things that are necessary for that person right. to get the supports that they need or um, um, to be uh, in the world in a way that's more comfortable, right? Yeah, right. You know, this is very similar. I think about how important comfort is when I think mm -hmm. about sensory um, preferences, sensory profiles, sensory sensitivities. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. have to know the edges of comfort yeah. and that when we move outside the edges of comfort, um, why? Yeah, yeah. Is it worth it? Yeah. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I think about like, um, I teach adult learners. I teach in a graduate program. Um, and things like, uh, if I have autistic students, we'll ask if we can turn the lights down or off because we have those horrible fluorescent overhead oh. lights. Right. Yeah. Um, and it, the answer is sort of, it depends. Like if it's, if there's no light in the room, that's a problem. But if we have a window, we can certainly do that. Um, or really work with them and say, you know, it, um, do you have sunglasses with you? And they say, oh, is it, it are you going to be okay with me if I wear sunglasses to class? And I said, well, I, I would know why. So having this conversation, you know, it, well, I'm going to be really worried about what other people think. And so I might say, um, if you're willing and if you're comfortable and you don't have to do this at all, um, if you want to let people know that's why you're wearing sunglasses. And again, you, you know, in a room full of burgeoning psychologists, usually everybody is like, oh, thanks for telling us. That's so cool that you have a way to deal with that. Thanks for educating me. Um, little kids might be a little more judgmental or not necessarily understand that. But then really little kids, usually it's, it, you flip back to that, of, I wasn't even thinking about why you were in sunglasses. It's okay with me. I don't care, you know. Yeah. Um, but there's so much trauma that happens with folks around judgment and um, not being seen that uh, the, the propensity is to pull inward and not share anything because it's too vulnerable. People have hurt me too much. I've not gotten my needs met. Yeah. Um, and so if you can do that slowly and get your need met, it's like, oh, maybe I can do this. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's the road to being empowered or self advocacy is a very long one. And it's, you know, many, many steps, as you know, um, and back and forth and back and forth. Yeah. For sure. I, I, I love that that's, you know, self advocacy is, is not just your ability to say what you need, right? Yeah. There's, right. It, your self knowledge has to be quite robust and you have to have right. a lexicon or symbols to represent 
how you can communicate that self knowledge, exactly. or how you understand it for yourself, before you even use it. Yeah. Um, and how many times, uh, not only maybe the the environment, so maybe a family system or a school system, but maybe there's someone in an intervention where it's like, it's either this way or no way. Like you, you either uh, behave this way because yeah. that's compliant. And yeah. so I think a lot of times in, with the adults, some of the adults that I support who have received pretty traditional ABA services, oh, right. yeah. they don't, they've been, to, they, they've been totally cut off to their yeah. own body signals because yeah, they've been trained to not pay yeah. attention to them. Yeah. 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 So we've got a lot of work to do and that yeah. it's a very formalized process to, to build self-knowledge. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I love about your example, Dana, with your student is that there's a collaboration. Yeah. It started with um, a disclosure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there was a space that was created for understanding. Yeah. And then it, there was a collaboration for a solution. Yeah. And I don't, uh, that's the piece that I wish we could do more often. Yeah. Rather than just saying, well, you're just going to have to deal with it because yeah. you can't turn the lights down. Like right. I can imagine happening. Yeah. Right. Or, mm -hmm. and the other side of the, the, the equation that I've seen, which is, well, that's not fair for everyone else. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, my personal oh. favorite. Yeah. yeah your personal. <laughs> Let's ask everybody else and see if they're okay with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, like as we like close up this episode, it's mm. really encouraging people to understand that there are, that senses are the first way we encode the world Yeah. yeah. for us. Um, neurotypicals, we don't, usually think about it that way. Right, um, right. We don't usually think about being in the world in a sensory way, actually, yeah. Um, yeah. unless we're very consciously, consciously minded or we're, or like for me, I'm pretty sound sensitive. So I just know there yeah. are some things or I'm visually sensitive as well. And so, you know, if I see a cupboard open, like it's my big trigger to yeah. you know, close yeah, it. Yeah. But, um, so that there, there are senses are important. Uh, they're the first way we encode the world, and that um, they're more than just what we've been taught. It's not yeah. just seeing, hearing, tasting, um, and touch, right? We've got yeah. proprioception, introspection, um, introception. Sorry, mm -hmm. um, and how we feel, feel in the world, right? Right. right. Yep. Um, and that for autistics. This is like drinking sometimes through a fire hose. Yeah, it's a daily, daily thing. A daily yeah. struggle. Mm -hmm. And that seeking to understand first mm -hmm. before we solve people's problems or make judgments. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really, we want to encourage people to maybe just take a moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take a moment, try to understand. Try to understand. Uh, and this is for everybody, actually. Yeah, yeah. Help me understand why. I don't yeah, understand I think that, why. Yeah, that's that. If I had one word to that people can do is just ask why, right? Ask why because that imparts curiosity, and I want to know instead of just saying, "Oh, labeling it like, oh, it's a tantrum." Yeah. Why is that happening? Yeah. You know, what might be contributing to that? And How that, do we understand it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Love it. Because what we do as psychologists, we just act like two-year-olds perpetually and say, why, why, why? Yeah, like seven times. Like yeah, we really yeah. haven't gone to the bottom of it unless we've hit the seventh why, right? There you go, like that's, yeah, exactly. That's the, until, you know, our clients are like, I, their eyes have rolled to the, yeah. to, the back of, <laughs> to the back of their head. They're like, oh my God. Anyway, um, driving yeah. insight, driving insight, driving insight. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Practicing communication, practicing, yeah. you know, saying, saying what it is, putting words to our experiences, you know, That's right. yeah. it's the, the fun part of being a psychologist. Um, Dana, number two, episode number two, episode two. number two. Yeah. And if, um, if for all of our audience that are listening, the, the all two of you now, cause you know, I'm thinking we've got one more person in our audience okay. in the first we've episode. So now we've got maybe two people in the audience. There you go. If there's something that you'd like Dana and I to have a conversation about, yeah. put it in the comments below. Um, or, or ask us why. Or ask us why. Yeah. Uh, and we we want to create that really nice, open, uh, curious space. Anyway, yeah. uh, thanks everyone for listening and watching. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye.